Paranormal Series, aka my and my best friend, Paranormal Novelist, whose name shall be left unknown for her privacy. It is our own Supernatural series, and I'm so excited to finally start it with you guys. There's a lot to go on here, as there are 28 books in total. Yes, 28. And I don't know if I'll be doing all of them, but I'm going to at least try. I will be only doing the first book, as I still have to finish up my other personal time and space series. But for now, this is what you guys get, and I hope you all enjoy. And similar to my last one, I'll be using some pictures, just not as much. As that can be very time consuming and it gets frustrating when I have to edit them in and make sure it doesn't conflict with the cover. So mainly you guys will be seeing the cover. However, when a new character is introduced, as if the character is important, I will use a picture so you guys can see who is who. As I know you guys know who the Supernatural cast is. Alright, I hope you all enjoy. Please like, comment, and subscribe! Prologue. Centuries ago, when the Archangel Michael defeated his younger brother, known as the Devil, and sent him down to hell, the fallen angel swore that he, one day he would return and take his vengeance on his father's most beloved creation, mankind. God knew that his son would one day return, but he wasn't sure when it would happen, so he prepared a prophecy to protect mankind and the rest of his children. In the world's darkest hour, and when the devil plots his revenge against humanity, he comes to claim, he comes to sire, the end of all things mortal. A spark of hope will shine when two hunters and two impacts will come together to stand up against him. Their offspring will have the, their parents' power and abilities strong enough to steal the devil away permanently. After creating this, God sent the tablet down to earth where it was found by the prophet Joshua. However, mankind was doubtful of the prophecy, as they had no idea what an empath or a hunter was. Still, they respected the Lord's judgment. But as the hands of time slowly turned, and nothing related to the prophecy happened. It was forgotten by mankind and pushed aside as just a silly story. Even the direct descendants of Adam and Eve or any empath alive were not aware of the other's existence. Until one day... In the 21st century, a group of construction workers was, was building a new church, and one of the workers accidentally hit a stone tablet with his shovel. He carefully brushed the dirt away and took away the crumbling tablet in his hands. He couldn't read the words, since it was written in Hebrew, but what the man didn't realize was that finding that old tablet brought the prophecy into place. Chapter 1 Elizabeth Aspen decided to go to the theater overnight to practice her lines for the upcoming play, Spoon River. About halfway through her lines, she heard something fall upstairs in the tech room. Thinking it was just her imagination, she turned her attention back to the script that she had in her hands. Out of the corner of her eye, when she, she saw something move simply from left to right, she thought that the director had allowed her to have the theater to herself and did not expect anyone else to be in there with her. Cautiously, she got out of off the main stage and made her way towards the technician room, which was on the right side of the entrance. As she got closer to the door, she heard a loud crash from the top of the stairs. Grabbing the doorknob, she pulled it open and started walking up, up the creepy stairs. Hello, she called out as another loud crash was heard. Okay, if this, is so, if this is someone pranking me, it's an odd funny. Suddenly, she heard another loud crash. Her heart sped up in her chest. She didn't want to stay here anymore. She just wanted to leave. She dropped her script and made a dash for the exit. However, she ran towards the door and slammed her face, causing her to start panicking. Come on, come on, come on, come on! She yelled frantically, pounding on the door. Thought it was no, it was locked. She felt the temperature in the room drop until she could see her breath. Her whole body shook, but she wasn't sure if it was from fear or cold. A shadow passed to the left of her, and before she could react, something attacked her and grabbed her by the throat. She tried to scream, but no sound came out of, out of her mouth. Elizabeth felt feverish. She had noticed that some of the wires from the spotlight slithered toward her like a snake. It wrapped around her throat and tightened her as the world around her started to go dark. <coughs> she let an increasing scream out before she breathed her last breath. 
<laughs> it was late at night. Something was off. Thinking that she was only thirsty, she walked out of her room and made her way to the kitchen. Christina and Shella had been living in a four-bedroom apartment, leaving two of the rooms open by any guests they wanted to spend the night. As Shella grabbed a bottle from the fridge, she felt pain shoot throughout her body, as she had felt something closing in around her throat. Shella gasped as she struggled to breathe. It took approximately five minutes before the strange phenomenon had disappeared. She breathed deeply as she was trying her best to catch her breath. At the exact same moment, Christina came running in into the kitchen, wearing a shirt and shorts. Christina, said Shella, worriedly. Did you feel that? Yes, girl, I did, said Christina, who was also also worried. Whatever it was, I don't think I want to find out, responds Shella, as she drank from her water bottle, now relieved that she could finally breathe. Sam and Dean Winchester had finished a job down in North Carolina, searching for a hitchhiking ghost that had been killing innocent people. They were driving down the highway towards Virginia in their 1967 Chevrolet Impala. During the day, when Sam stumbled across a news clip, Breaking news, said the newscaster. Young college sophomore Elizabeth Ashby was found dead in the sales theater this morning, and local college students and staff members are stumped at what happened. She spoken to fellow classmates Christina Casa and Shella Muriel, who had gone to the theater early this morning. When Dean heard the news clip, he pulled over to the side of, of the road. Dean listened to this, says Sam, whose brown eyes stood focused on the news recording. Dean put the car in park and listened to what the newscaster said. And the two girls. Dean looked at the video and saw an image of two young girls, one who was 22 and the other who was about 21. So tell me, lady, said the newscaster, how did you come across Elizabeth's body? The girl with brown hair and Asian features, Asian features spoke first. Well, we were heading to the theater so I could help Priscilla learn her lines. When we noticed lights flickering in the technician room, says Shella, we walked upstairs and discovered our friend Elizabeth hanging from the ceiling. Police are calling it a suicide. Do you have any idea why she would do that? Questioned the newscaster. There was no way Elizabeth would do something like this, says the short brown-haired girl with Italian features. She never had a suicidal bone in her body. I don't think this was a suicide, says Shella, catching Dean's attention. There was nothing in that room that could allow her to reach the ceiling and jump down, let alone grabbing wires from the stage lights, she continued. The wires were too high for her to reach. Before the newscaster could continue, Sam had left the browser as he turned towards his brother. Well, questioned Sam. So we got a job to do. But where is the college? asked Dean. Sam pulled out a map on his phone and began looking for the location until he spotted the title of the school. It's located in Fair, Virginia, responded Sam as he folded the map. Dean immediately started the car and made his way to the college. Whatever happened at the school, they were determined to find out and hopefully help defeat whatever caused the death of that young woman. After the incident, which led the college shocked, they decided to continue on with their normal routine. Well, as normal as you can get when you wasn't something that would scar you for life. Most of the students didn't want to talk about it. Shella and Christina knew it would have happened before it even happened, as they could feel it. It terrified them, especially since they had a bad feeling about the campus since they got back from their week off. I can't believe that happened to Elizabeth, says Christina. I know, and campus still wants to keep going, responded Shella, as the girls made their way to the chapel. As they crossed the street, they noticed a 1967 Chevrolet Impala entered the main campus. Inside, the girls recognized the driver and thought that they were seeing things. Shrugging their thoughts aside, the girls walked into the chapel as their class had started. They took a seat next to each other at the same time Sam and Dean parked behind the tennis court and climbed out of their car. So what's the plan? asked Sam as he turned towards his brother. We talked to some of those students on campus and figure out what really happened, and Dean answered. I think we should talk to the two students who found the girl's body, says Sam. But you know we gotta blend in, right? Yes, I know, Sammy. This isn't my first rodeo, remember? What I mean is we blend in as students, not as officers, says Sam, as he rolled his eyes at his brother. After briefly arguing, Dean grabbed an EMF reader and placed it in his pocket. Let's hope these students aren't like you, Dean commented. Dean is college, Sam continued, as he walked around Bassett Hall, looking for any students. Eventually, he spotted a young girl, about 19 or 20, with straight, long brunette hair, brown eyes, and glasses. Sam tapped Dean's shoulder, getting his brother's attention. What? Dean asked while Sam pointed at the young girl. Found one, let's go talk to her, said Sam. Wow! She's hot. Sam groaned as he had been annoyed with his brother, who had only ever seemed to focus on how attractive the girl was. 
Do you only have one brain cell that focuses on cute girls? Sam said sarcastically. Without commenting, he and Sam walked over to the young brunette, who was preoccupied listening to music. They stopped in front of her as she looked at the two men who she hadn't seen on campus before. Can I help you? questioned the girl. Or are you just going to block my path? Sorry, said Sam, who wasn't new to the college life due to his time at Stanford. My name is Sam, and this is my brother Dean. We're transfers from the Dean of Tech. Well, that explains why I haven't seen you around before, says the young girl. I'm Lindsay. It's nice to meet you. She held her hand to Sam and Dean and shook it. What brings you here? Oh, not much. We just prefer this whole campus life, says Sam. He didn't mind having a conversation with Lindsay. Do I know you? You both look familiar. Nah, says Dean. But do you think we could ask a few questions about campus if you're free? Lindsay looked at her watch to make sure that she had enough time and wasn't going to be late for band rehearsal. Seeing that she was free, she made her way over to the bench in front of the dormitory and sat down as Sam and Dean sat down either side of her.